Oh, do I need to see you guys talking to me? That would be nice, I guess. So I know that you're watching and not sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I want to start out Project Feeder Watch. I don't know how many people in the group actually do Project Feeder Watch. I've been doing it on and off for many years. It's a really great program through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And the start, it always has this kickoff in November. And you have certain dates that each week that you report on what birds you've seen at your feeders. And based on those reports across the entire United States and into Canada, um, this little presentation, it's, a, it's, it's short, but it's got a lot of good information. Start. So if you look at the Project Feeder Watch region, we are this little teeny tiny um, green one called the Mid-Atlantic. Well, we're not that little because they stuck Virginia in with us in West Virginia. So we're kind of big compared to like the Northeast region. So we're the Mid-Atlantic region. So this is a sample paper page. So don't jump to conclusions yet. This is to show us how each of the slides will look. It'll show the regional rank and the continental rank. It'll show a map and food preferences. Oops. There you are. So this species was the 20 most commonly reported bird in your region. The same species was the 13 most commonly reported in North America. And you guys are hearing me? Yes? I'm Someone here. tell me. Oh, thank you, Jane. So regional rank, the species was seen at 47% of the feeder watch count sites. And when present at a site, an average of 2.6 birds were reported. So average flock size. So number 20 on this list is Northern Mockingbird. This is the only first year I've ever had a mockingbird come to my feeder. And he seemed to really like coming to get um, suet and peanut butter that we had put out for him. So it says that 56% of feeders have seen him. Average flock size, 1.1. 1 .1, so that just usually means one. And continentally, 26 overall is in the top 26. American crow is number 19. They like meat scraps. I do not recommend putting out meat scraps because that also can attract foxes, raccoons, other kinds of animals that you might not want to have. Um, rampaging in your backyard. But um, crows come 60% of feeders, average flock size 2.6, and continentally, number 13. Song sparrow. I do get many song sparrows at my feeders. Um, song sparrow is a neat one, not only because of his song, because someone told me years ago that it looks like he's wearing a little bow tie. And that is one of the ways I've always been able to tell when I have a song sparrow, if he's not singing, is I look for his little black bow tie on his chest. Seen at 63% of feeders, average flock size 1.6. Continentally, 17. And he likes mixed seed. American robin. I never get American robins at my feeder. I live on a wetlands. There's plenty of berry bushes out in the wild, in the woods and in the wetlands for them to go to. So I think that's why I never have gotten robins coming to my feeder because they like fresh and dried fruits. So they're seen as 64% of feeders. Average flock size 3.2, continentally number 12. So it's kind of flipped. Now here's one of the bully birds, house sparrow, not native introduced here from Europe, um, live in everybody's gutters and dryer vents and all kinds of places that they can find places to inside of garage roofs. Um, so that's why the average flock size is 6.1. They usually travel in a group. They're number 16. They like mixed seed. But they like any seeds that you put out. I think this bird is beautiful, the common grackle. Uh, I love the colors of them. And sometimes, since I live in a wetland, sometimes we get the bronze crackle, but only certain times of the year. So it said 66% of the feeders reported seeing them. Usually about seven come, except if you have a lot of acorns and then a hundred come and knock the acorns on your head. So watch out if you have a lot of oak trees in your yard because the grackles really like them.
This is another problem bird, European starling, was introduced to the United States. Um, number 14 on ranking, 73% of uh, feeder watchers have seen it. Average five of them come at a time, and they all try to shove themselves into your suet feeder. Their food preference is suet. We will talk about that a little bit later, about how to avoid being overtaken by the starlings. Oh, I just want to say one thing, go back to starlings. Um, starlings and cowbirds. I used to work with Greg Kearns. Some of you know him from Protection River Park. And um, he would have us capture starlings and cowbirds for him to use in his raptor banding program. So they went to a good use. Now, one of my favorite birds that comes to our feeders is white-breasted nuthatch. Mm -hmm. um, number 13, 77% of feeders. They like suet, sunflower seeds, and peanuts. And just like their name, Nuthatch, they take the peanuts and they stash it in holes in the tree. So if you look at the, the tree right below him in the picture, there's a hole there. And he will store many different seeds in there. So you think it's it's silly. He flies back and forth with one seed in his beak or one peanut back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But he stores it for later and then he goes back to his caches. He also will shove small seeds under the bark of trees. And they have a very good, amazing memory to remember where all their seeds are that they stash. So really they should be called nut stashers. White-throated sparrow. Everyone gets all excited when you say, by accident, you say you saw a white headed sparrow. It's white throated sparrow. They um, are number 12, seen in 81% of feeders. Usually about four of them come at one time. They like mixed seed. They'll feed on the ground. They like platform feeders. Carolina wren, they announce whenever they're coming to your feeder. Um, number 11, 82% of feeders have seen them. They will stick around and and glean from your feeders all around. They like, uh, what mine do is they wait till the other birds feed on the suet and then they go underneath and feed on all the little pieces of suet that have been knocked out. Carolina wren is one of the birds that you could put a house up for the winter time that they'll go into and, or a wren nest they'll go into and stay for the winter time. Here's red bellied woodpecker. This is the, the male and you can see the red on his belly where he gets his name. They really like, Suet, number 10, seen in 83% of feeders, average flock size 1.2. Probably the most common woodpecker you would see at your feeder. You might see hairy or downy, but this is the one that, that comes quite frequently and announces that it's there. American goldfinches, they like a specific kind of seed called Niger seed, or it's very skinny and small seed, and you can feed them with a sock or a special Niger feeder tube. The interesting thing people always say to me is they don't realize that the yellow canary, wild canary goldfinch is the same thing as this bird that they see in the winter time. So many people don't realize that they change color and that they molt into this winter plumage. So they stay here year round and they're the latest to nest. They nest as late as August into the end of September, um, having their second nest because they eat a lot of the seeds that are the fall seeds off of the different plants that are out in the gardens. So these are seen at 85% of feeders. Here's downy woodpecker. Downy diminutive, hairy huge, meaning that downy has the teeny beak and the hairy has a much larger beak and so a larger bird, but they actually look almost identical to each other except for based on size you have to check them out. This is seen at 87% of feeders. And this is an interesting thing. They're using a um, branch with a hole cut in it where you put um, either peanut butter or suet plugs into it. And that is specifically for your woodpeckers. And he's continentally ranked number three. So he's right up there in the top five. Number seven, Blue Jay, seen at 88% 80, of feeders. They say average flock size 2.4. But here in Maryland, the Blue Jays form a very large, they call it a mob. Um, there'll be a, almost between maybe nine to 11 of them in the wintertime, cruising around, checking out feeders. And they come, and so they might be at your feeder for a couple of days, and then they disappear because somebody else put something better out. 
or you might have a you might have a raptor, a bird of prey nearby, and so they'll fly away and they'll disappear, and then the whole big flock will come back again. Their favorite things are striped sunflower seeds and peanuts and shell, and they also take it and stash it in holes in the trees and go back and get it later. I did an interesting experiment at my house. I put peanuts out of the shell and peanuts in the shell, and they specifically wanted the peanuts in the shell. Hmm. That's what they took. Um, I think it's because in their mind it will store better. Because um, it seems to me, why wouldn't you want to just take the peanuts already out of the shell and munch them up? Leave that for the wrens. They'll do that. House finch, number six, seen at 90% of feeders. They will go on the Niger feeder, but they also will go on black roll sunflower and sunflower chips, which is called Hulk sunflower seed. Sunflower chips are a very popular. It's a no mess seed blend. And sometimes if you're lucky in the wintertime, like at our house, we get the purple finch that comes and hangs out. Usually just a, one or two of them. This year, we probably shall have three because they had a baby last year. But house finch is the, is the red colored finch that comes. And somebody said there's been pine skin seen already. They are as confusing ones that come to the same feeders. Tufted titmouse, number five, 93% of feeders. So cute. This little tufty head. People say to me, why well, I stopped having a wild bird center because people would say, well, I want to feed those little cardinals that are gray. I said, little cardinals that are gray. They said, you know. They're like little miniature cardinals, but they're gray. I said, you mean tough to tit mice? They said, oh, they have their own name. I was like, oh, I'm going back to being a naturalist. Um, so they like striped sunflower seed and black hole sunflower seeds. Now here's a neat one, because some of you that live farther north, like Ken, um, get the black cap chickadee. Um, I know that at Patuxent Wildlife Refuge, we used to always get black, we'd be right on the line and get black cap chickadees there quite commonly. But then down here, way down in the south in Calvert County, we just get the Carolina chickadee. The thing that I learned is that the black cap chickadee, since he's from the north, carries a hockey stick. And you see the arrow pointing to his hockey stick. It's like a also like an upside down L on his, on his body. Um, and they do have a slightly different call. They both like sunflower seeds. When we were in Colorado, we got to see the mountain chickadee and it had a totally different song and it was very, very tiny. We also saw lots and lots of pygmy nuthatches. So dark-eyed junco, I call this a snowbird. They show up at this time of the year, but they move south from their breeding grounds and to them, Maryland is the south. And so you will see them at 96% of feeders. The, this is the male with the black on the top and the white on the belly, but the girls are a little bit tanner and not as distinct. They like mixed seeds. They really like safflower at my feeders. Morning dove, speaking of birds that like safflower, I had seven of these at my feeder this morning because I put a cardinal mix out, which is black oil and safflower mix. And they were all trying to fit into one teeny little tray. Seven giant doves were all trying to sit there together. They Their average flock size is 4.7. They do come in flocks. They also breed for life. So you will often see two doves that come at one time. You can feed crack corn, but I will talk about that later. I avoid crack corn because I do not want to have squirrel problems. Cardinal has that beautiful beak that's big and cone shaped for cracking seeds. And they are number one rank here in Maryland, seen at 90% of the feeders. They like striped sunflower seeds, black oil sunflower seeds, and safflower seeds. If you really want to just attract cardinals, have a lot of the striped sunflower seed, which is the big fat sunflower seeds, because they have no problem cracking it open with their beaks and safflower seed. So you can have your own, and that's when that's often called cardinal mix. So if you're interested in Project Feeder Watch, there's a link. I can at also attach a link in an email that can go out. Um, the money goes to just helping coordinate all the information that they gather from it. I think it's very amazing a lot of the work that Cornell does for um, citizen science. 
and you get this really great poster of the backyard birds. All right. Should I stop for a second and see if anyone has questions about that? I hear nothing. All right. He's on his way. He just had to get back to his phone. This is my, um, all right. So can you see it says Prince George's Audubon Society? Are you, is everyone seeing that? Yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about, uh, I wanted to do that introduction talk about which are the top birds that come to feeding. Um, two things. One of the big pushes in Audubon is plants for birds. And I know we have Kathy here tonight. Um, the, the habitat advisors have been doing a lot of great work on helping people have better habitat for birds in their yards. And so this talk I did, Bur Berries for Birds, talks about all the native plants that you could have in your yard that could make your yard really gangbusters to attract a bigger variety of birds. And it's just an excuse so that I can put lots and lots of pictures of birds on my slides so, to talk. So we have our chickadees and our woodpeckers and our mockingbird. And I love this picture of this eat, um, cedar waxwing, not eating your cedar waxwing, throwing the berries into its mouth. Tufty titmouse, red-bellied woodpecker, Carolina wren, blue jays, bluebirds, black-capped chickadee. Does anyone know what this little woodpecker up in the left corner is eating? What berries is he eating? Poison ivy? That is correct. Yes. So when, so yes, poison ivy. Um, so when you say, how come there's so much poison ivy around? Well, a lot of birds love to eat the berries in the wintertime. Not in the top five, the top number, top number one. We'll talk about it today. Top number one is bayberries. And we will oh. learn a little bit more about that. Good. So winter can be a hard time for wildlife. So you should make a garden plan. So we're going to, this is what I'm going to talk about. Top six winter birds that eat berries. Top six berries that produce for birds. Some more suggestions of berries for birds. Birdscaping. Plants to avoid. And how you can certify your yard. I'm sure you all heard about Doug Tallamy and Bringing Nature Home. He's written several other books like the Homegrown National Parks Program. But what he was saying, and this really spoke to me, that birds need to build energy stores to fuel their long flights to where food is more plentiful. Birds that are over winter and cold climates need to keep a high metabolism to avoid freezing to death. So Doug Tallamy said that birds, insects, and native plants point out that birds that migrate are typically insectivores. The ones that stay behind tend to be omnivores. Chickadees and titmice do seek insects, but also eat seeds. They need their protein and fat. So all plants do not support wildlife equally. Some plants do a much better job of supporting wildlife throughout the year. So adding native species year round, create a food supply in your yard. In your backyard, if you have a homeowner's association, but I'm going to show you there's a couple plants you could plant in your front yard. Your neighbors would come over and say, oh, what is that beautiful bush you have? So some plants that are really excellent are goldenrods, coneflowers, sunflowers, thoroughworts, oaks, cherries, and service berries. One nest of chickadees needs 7,000 caterpillars over six weeks during the nesting season. So... Doug found out with his research and his interns and his projects across the country, the number one trees for that are oaks, cherries, and service berries. So having those in the springtime helps us with the birds and their babies. But what will help us in the wintertime? This is a little part that you guys know about native plants and exotic plants, right? So I'm not going to get involved in that, but native plants have formed relationships with native wildlife over thousands of years and exotic plants have evolved in other parts of the world. 
They don't always support our wildlife here as well as native plants. And sometimes they can escape and cause problems. Some plant red berry plants and other berry plants you don't want to have in your yard. Nandina or heavenly bamboo. The berries contain the colder the winter we have, the higher amount of cyanide is in the berries. And they had a problem a couple of years ago in Northern Virginia where deer, bears, and birds that ate um, Nandina berries died from or got sick from cyanide poisoning. So if you do have this plant in your yard, the best thing to do is to snip off these berries, use them for a decoration, and then put them in trash bags. Other plants, Japanese viburnums, could, I can't say this word, could, that oriental bittersweet, Japanese honeysuckle, wineberry, Lots of people like wineberry. They like to eat it. That's great. Eat it all up as much as you want. Um, but don't plant it. And barberries, which are these little droops that hang down. Autumn olive and privet. Privet has the black berries. And Calvert County has quite a lot of privet because it used to be planted as a hedge. Hmm. So birds can eat these berries. But some of the berries are not good for them. Like I said before, the Nandina, the heavenly bamboo is not good for the birds. Um, barberry, it's a tick nursery. That's the big research they're doing on it. That because the bush is prickly, the deer will rub against it. The ticks will jump on the deer. And then the ticks can jump back on the barberries and wait for rides on other deer. And my husband as a park ranger, has been working for years to get rid of the bush honeysuckle that was planted in the 50s and 60s in all the parks in Prince George's County um, because it was used to be considered a great plant for erosion control because it grew super fast and it spread into big thickets, which we now know means invasive species. So what are good species? Not kudzu and not marsh marigolds. If you hike over a jug at... Um, Governor's Bridge in the spring, all that yellow plant that's on the ground, those are all invasive species. So some good things for winter. Birds need berries. Here's cedar waxwings, a yellow rump warbler, mockingbird. Top six birds that like berries, bluebirds, catbirds, Cedar waxwings, yellow rump warblers, robins, and orioles. And this little warbler is eating bayberries. The oriole is a fruit eating bird. And I know every year I get jealous because people have orioles to stay like all winter at their house. And I'm like, how are you keeping an oriole? How are you getting an oriole to stay for so many months at your house? Well, they put out jelly for them. Grape jelly is very good. Um, ones that are not high in sugars are better. Like, so an organic grape jelly would be better for them <coughs> than smuckers. But they love to eat the berries. They'll come through in small flocks and and pull the berries off of viburnums and hollies. One of the things that Audubon at Patterson Park did is they um, created the Bird Friendly Habitat Program with Aaron Reed Miller. And people could get the sign and has now spread out and become one of our components of the Habitat Advisors. I think ours has a bluebird on it for the people in Prince George's County. Is that right? I hope so. <coughs> so the tie-in with the Orioles, it's, it's our state bird. It's the mascot. It's the mascot for the baseball team is they worked with National Wildlife Federation and with Aaron Reed Miller and Patterson, National Audubon Patterson Park to put in an Oriole garden up there outside of Camden Yards. But one of the most important things to put in a, a garden is berries and native berries. So viburnums, junipers, um, winter berries, these are all natives that provide food for throughout the winter. Eastern red cedar or juniper, American holly, winterberry, and inkberry, which has a black colored berry, 
crab apples, viburnums, like American cranberry bush and possum haw. Viburnums have some of the coolest names. Elderberry and bayberries are all really good plants. Now, the elderberries will not have berries in the winter, but the viburnums, the bayberries, the hollies, and the cedars all persist through the winter. Some people say, oh, I don't want to have the birds come and eat all my berries. Well, we're not talking about birds eating strawberries or raspberries in your garden, which could happen. But one thing you should do is if you're going to put a fence, use a hardware cloth fence to keep groundhogs and other animals away. But if you put a big net over top of your berry bushes, then you're ruining the whole reason of having wildlife habitat. And also birds can get trapped within that fence, the screening and the netting. So I, the hardware cloth will keep out rodents and will not keep out the birds, but we're not really talking about crop berries. It's less unless you're growing blueberries. So why is bayberry the number one plant for birds? Bayberries have a thick coating of wax on the outside of the berries. And there's two types of bayberries in our area, the Southern bayberry and the Northern bayberry. They also call it, other nicknames are the bay laurel. It has a really neat scent. And a lot of people have seen it as a Williamsburg bayberry candle. So before the people first moved here, the colonists moved here to the States. They used mostly for candles. They used whale, blubber, and tallow and animal fat. So those candles smoked a lot and were kind of smelly. Or they used a lantern that used the oil. So when they found that these, these candles could be made from the bayberry wax, it was quite amazing to have a nice, beautiful scented candle. Well, because it has such a high wax content, it also has a high fat content. So that's why you'll see mixed flocks of warblers swarming over bayberries in the fall and the winter, because they can get a lot of their fat and protein from eating the bayberries. Another one that they really like are juniper eastern red cedar. And we were just out today looking at the junipers are all setting their berries. And I know some of you might want to go and get all the berries and make your own bathtub gin. No, it's a joke, you know, I'm joking. But I mean, that is the flavor of gin is from junipers. But it also has the same waxy coating like the bayberries. So it's also high in fat. So it's number two on the list for winter birds. Hollies have many, 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 many berries that persist through the winter. So they are great for when a flock of robins or a flock of cedar waxwings comes through. They know that there's going to be more berries as long as they can find hollies growing in the woods or in your yard. And the black colored holly berries are inkberry hollies, which are small and make very good hedges and shrubs like in your front yard. And winter berries are what the mockingbird's eating. And that's a beautiful, all the leaves fall off of it, but the berries stay on. So that's called a deciduous holly meaning that its leaves fall off. So that's a very beautiful ornamental. Arrowwood viburnums, a native species that's one of the top because the berries persist into the late fall. And they have many viburnums that are native have beautiful different colors of berries, red, red or white or dark blue. They're very good fruits that the birds rely on. And viburnums most of the time are a shrub. You could keep trimming them back so they're a shrub. Except at my house, we let the arrowwood grow and we didn't realize that it could grow to 10 or 11 feet tall, which I guess is why they would cut it to make it into arrows because it grows super tall and straight. But if you trim it back, then it flowers on the new wood and you can have it as a shrub. So these are some pictures. The viburnums have beautiful flowers and nice big clusters or umbels of, of berries. This one, the red one over is the cranberry bush. How do you know that you have a native viburnum versus a non-native one? I think this is really weird, but the um, the native ones don't put out much of a smell, but the non-native viburnums, the Japanese viburnums, stink really badly. So they might attract different kinds of pollinators than than bees and butterflies. 
So if you're walking somewhere and you see these beautiful big viburnums, but they're really stinky, it's probably, they are the Japanese viburnum. Elderberries, beautyberries, and chokeberries are very good for wildlife. And the beautyberry, you want to make sure you're getting the coastal plain American beautyberry, where the berries are like thick clumps, versus if it has teeny tiny berries all over it, or they look like they're on little strings, those are the ornamental. That's not native, not really causing a problem, but doesn't provide as much food or fats for our native birds. And crab apples and cherries, crab apples persist, so they're a good food. Also persimmons, I didn't put that on the list, but persimmons are also a very good neat native tree that you could have um, along your property lines. And when we were growing up, we always called this the bird cherry or the pin cherry, which is wild cherries. And they're a beautiful understory tree. They don't get that big unless they're left to grow for years and years and years and provide a lot of food for wildlife. And it shows that in July is when they have their berries, but a very good food for the robins. So my suggestion is to go native, add some bushes or shrubs for wildlife such for native birds. You could make a corner shrub garden. You could look at what trees you already have in your yard and do an inventory. You could find a garden center that supplies local species. Some of the local species places that are good here are environmental concern on the Eastern shore. Atkins Arboretum has a big native plant sale. And then very close to us is Brain fell out. Chesapeake Natives? Chesapeake Natives. <laughs> yes, Chesapeake Natives in um, Rosaryville. And they do beautiful plant sales. And I know that one of our members, Barry, um, works there quite often and helps them with their pollinator events and other kinds of plant events that they have. And recently, we have a new place right here in um, right up the road from us called Bonaterra. And he is new in the native area, but he... Is a Jeremy's a very cool guy, and you can get if you have a project where you want to read landscape with more natives, he might be a person you would like to talk to. So, when you go to a garden center that supplies local species, that's good. Not always doesn't have, Home Depot and Lowe's. Oftentimes, they sell cultivars that might look beautiful in your yard, but not might not provide the right kinds of foods for the wildlife. And you can add color to your fall and winter landscape by adding natives. Um, people keep raving about how fantastic my blueberry bushes are that I have at my nature center. They are low bush and high bush blueberries, and they turn brilliant red in the fall. Plus, they had the berries in the summertime. So I think a blueberry makes a fantastic shrubbery, and the birds like it too. I'm going to skip over that. And yes, since we're going towards the winter, we're gonna. But you can get certified with National Wildlife Habitat or through our habitat advisors here in Maryland. Um, you, there's many other programs, but all of them have the same basic principles that you need shelter, food, and water. And important to provide food, supply water, create cover, provide places to raise young, garden sustainably, and get certified. The create cover is really important when you're doing wildlife landscaping because you don't want to have your feeders out on a pole in the middle of the yard with no place for the smaller birds to dart and hide in case a raptor comes in. It won't be too long if you have a lot of bird activity in your yard that like sharp shin, Cooper's hawk, any of those guys might come and check it out to see what's going on. And... They have to eat too, but you'd rather not them not eat your favorite doves. So if you plant it, and here's another one that I did not talk about, but the staghorn sumac is a really nice bird-friendly plant and turns beautiful scarlet colors in the fall. And remember, if you plant it, they will come. If you do not want to re-landscape your yard, then you can do some bird feeding. And here are a couple slides just about good tips for bird feeders. Ones with a lid 
or a cage are better overall? The open platform, if you must specifically want to get birds like nut hatches or doves, an open platform is very good for that. A covered cage is good if you do not want to have squirrels, starlings, and grackles taking over your yard. And the same thing with the dome. You can make the dome very short. You can raise it up or make it shorter if you only want to get smaller birds. I have never had a tree swallow come to my bird feeder in my entire life, but that's why I want to share this picture because, hey, if you get this feeder, you're going to get a tree swallow because we know that tree swallows eat sunflower seeds. No, they eat insects, but it's still a cute picture. So don't believe everything you see in advertisements. This is very nice. This is a fairly new thing in the past 15 years is the no way seed, which is um, millet, peanuts, and um, sunflower chips. You put that in your feeders. You really, people say it's expensive, but you use so much less because there's not so much waste all over your deck or on the ground. And the birds don't, believe it or not, if you buy cheap bird seed for, you know, $20 for a 40 pound bag, there is a lot of wheat and prozo millet and other things. And the birds will just Stand on your feeder and scoot it all out. Scoot, 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 all the junk. And then you have a mess on the ground or, and that's with homeowners associations. But if you had the shell free, there's really not that much mess. Also black oil sunflower seeds are, uh, are the most number one seed for birds. Unless you're a finch, then of course it's Niger. And once again, Sure, everybody wants to have a rose breast or gross beak come to their suet feeder, but these kind of suet feeders, I don't know. We have as soon as a raccoon or a squirrel finds it, they unhook it and they carry it away. The one that's in a cage is much better. It controls what birds are coming to eat your suet. The squirrels cannot steal all your suet cakes. Or this upside down feeder, I really like that. I have one, and the red belly loves it. And they can cling on it, but their feet are very strong, and they have you know, they can use their back toes and hold on. And then you can even buy them a special suet called woodpecker treat. I really like the CNS brand of woodpe of of suet. It lasts for a long time. It, you can also buy it when it's on sale and freeze it uh, for up to six months, and it still is good for the following year. But do not store suet cakes all year round in a box in your garage and expect it not to go rancid because it is made with fats from animals like lard. And this was my dream. Yes, we all would like to have this happen, right? Um, people are always saying, oh, look at the Pileatids all came to my suet feeder. I'm like, what? I would like that to happen. Now I've seen Pileatids many times in our woods, but they do not ever come to my suet feeder. So that is goal before next year, somehow get them to come out. So provide habitat, cover and seed options, and you'll be ready for a feeder watch yard. If you're having a really hard time where you're having a lot of bully birds come, switch to white safflower for a week. Cardinals will continue to come and doves will continue to come, but birds that can't crack open a safflower seed will leave. So bully birds like house sparrows will go away. And that is a good trick that I learned when I worked at the Wild Bird Center. So I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about berries for birds and bird feeding. I'll take questions if there's any. Well, I want to thank you very much, Lisa. Um, when I moved down to uh, Maryland from Western New York and uh, moved in an area with an HOA, um, I immediately switched to uh, shelled uh, sunflower seeds, the chips. Yes. And your observation with respect to that was right on, although the actual bag costs a lot more than the uh, uh, shelled black oil sunflower, it lasts longer. Uh, the birds eat it all. There's no waste underneath. Uh, it does not attract vermin. Um, and uh, it was a well 
worth the switch to go from uh, regular black oil to the shelled. Uh, and, uh, you know, you don't have to clean up your yard because there's no waste underneath. I really, it was a really major switch. I'm going to see what I can do about adding peanuts in the shell to my shelled nut mix to see if that works. And I really appreciated a lot of your tips. Thank you. When I had the Wild Bird Center, there was um, a man and his daughter that were coming in by a 20 pound bag of peanuts in the shell every two weeks. Mm -hmm. I said, what can, what possibly are you feeding that you need 20 pounds of peanuts in the shell? And he goes, oh, you, and he took some pictures and he showed me, they spread them on their whole back patio. And then they sat there and they would sit there and watch the squirrels and the woodpeckers and the blue jays all come until they they had a neighbor move in who said they had a peanut allergy and that the squirrels were bringing the peanuts into their yard. That was a sad day for the Wild Bird Center because we were making quite a lot of money from their their bird feeding project. <laughs> but that was a lot of peanuts. <laughs> Lisa, so, what, what was yeah. the, um, the seed that you said to put out if you have bully birds? Safflower. It's white safflower. Okay. And that will make the bully birds go away. And then once the bully birds go away, you can mix that with your black oil sunflower and have a cardinal mix, which was they love. The other thing that I started doing was I was buying niger seed and niger seed can go rancid because it's other um, reason that it is um, grown is because it's made into oil for cooking. And so if you store it in a can over the summer and then get it out and put it out in the winter for your goldfinches, it's going to smell like a really old rancid oil smell. I mean, it's very obvious that it smells off. Don't try to throw it out there and hope that some goldfinches are going to eat it. It's just not, not worth it. But what you can do is if you don't think it's rancid, but it's kind of old, mix it with sunflower chips and put it in your feeder. And all the woodpeckers will come to your Niger feeder and pull out the little chips. And once they start at having the attraction, then the goldfinches will be like, I need to go over there and see what's going on over there. So I have found some good tricks like that. But I did not used to believe in platform feeders because it seemed to me it was a way for the raccoon or the squirrel to just come and make a mess. But now that I realize if I put different kinds of seeds out, it's very... Um, It's very cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that specific birds will come to specific seeds and they'll be on the lookout. Um, the wrens know whenever we put out the, the sunflower chips, they're there. They know. They must talk to each other. And Kathy, is the sign that the Habitat Advisors give out, I should get a picture of it for my presentation. It looks different, right? It's the same sign, but it has a decal. It has our, the chapter decal on it. So it has okay. to be there, there, there. All right. Lisa. Yes. Um, I've got a uh, platform feeder with a um, little squirrel baffle under it. And I've never seen a squirrel on that feeder or a raccoon. It's really fairly easy to set up. Oh, about, you put it on a you put it on a post with a baffle. Yes. Yeah. It's that about that is a very feet. good good way to do it. it. It's about six and a half feet off the ground with um um nothing around it, close enough for a squirrel to jump on anyway, and it's been no problem for years. We didn't really have problems with squirrels. We had a very hungry female raccoon that had babies, and she was living up in a hollow tree near our house, and she came down last year and ate entire cakes of suet while we watched her the whole cake of suet ugh. because she she was starving from raising her four raccoon kids and then the night they all came onto our porch was the night that I, the next morning i packed up all my bird feeders for a couple of weeks because that five raccoons going they were just uh, a mess so i understand when people complain about wildlife going crazy but we don't have it bad out in colorado they have elk and bear and mule deer that just come up and chew the posts until the bird feeder falls down or just smash it until the bird feeder falls down. I was amazed how much flashing and metal around all their bird feeder stations that they had to put up. 
So we have pretty good birding. So I hope that that I'll hear some better reports over this winter. How many of you guys do Project Feeder Watch? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Oh, Fred and Teresa. And I've done it. I do. Okay. Bobby. That's Bobby. Oh, Bobby. Oh, great. What are some good birds that you'd like to see in the winter? Like, I know last year red-breasted nuthatches came as well as white-breasted. And that was pretty exciting. To Fox me, it was. Sparrow. Say it again. <laughs> fox sparrow oh what do you put out to get fox sparrows i just throw millet on the ground under the bushes wow oh i didn't have any last year but that's generally what i put under there for the ground feeder wow. and the same thing that, that i've done that with to get towhees to come out because mm -hmm. they will not come up to the feeders except if there's snow but um put the millet snow. under the snow bushes come. so we can hope for snow this year yeah, I did just hear that we're supposed to get substantial amount of snow last year, we and got that more. and not okay. not just from woolly bear predictions because I have a friend that says, "How can I be a scientist and believe in woolly bears?" <laughs> I, said, I said, "Look, I was born on Groundhog's Day. I believe in groundhogs too. It's just a thing." I said, "But the, an actual weatherman who I really trust said that there all signs point to a little bit colder and snowier winter this year." which would be good because we haven't got as much moisture this year as we needed. Right. We need the rain, the moisture. Yeah. Yeah. We need the rain and the snow. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed my talk. It wasn't, I hope it wasn't too um, elementary. No. I, no, it's interesting. I just think it's very, I think it's fascinating now that I got to go to a national conference about, um, People are like, oh, you get to see cardinals all the time. You're so lucky. And I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> but then I said, you see Stellar's Jays and they're so gorgeous. And they're like, really? And magpies. Magpies are like gorgeous, amazing birds. And they're like, no, they're not. I'm like, yes. Magpies, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and also we saw mountain bluebirds and they were very beautiful. So um, I just... It's interesting across the country how different people. Oh, and the guy at the Lake Estes was staking out with his giant camera, a kingfisher. And they he, they even had a picture of it on the cover of their local paper because mm -hmm. a kingfisher is very rare to have there in the fall at up in the Colorado Rockies. I was like, oh, okay. But, you know, the same way as if they, people were here, they'd be so excited about all the eagles that we have on a regular basis. Right. Um, they would say, oh, you're so lucky to see eagles all the time. We're like, I guess so. So I really enjoyed that. And um, definitely have gotten some really interesting people that come to this area on a regular basis. Uh, some of the people from Chile that want to come out and see, so they want to come to Lake Artemisia and go on a bird walk. They are here. Um, for the next six months, trying to get money from U.S. aid to help with um, bird research and MODIS, which is the tracking system for birds. And they are living up in um, Bethesda. And they said they would like to come and see Lake Artemisia and meet some of our bird group. So well, I will have to, <laughs> I think that would be great, right, 